Okay, so good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the April Juice Lecture. Today we have three amazing speakers who will be talking about uh, neuromodulation. But before we do that, we would like to thank uh, Oatley Vigman for sponsoring today's lunch for those of you who are currently at the Lynch Center. And we have a video from Troy Lehman, a representative with a few words. So let's uh, cue that up and hopefully it will work this time. Hello, uh, Oli Vigman is very proud of its longstanding commitment to Toronto Rehab. Uh, we've been a, a supporter of Toronto Rehab for over 16 years now, most recently making gifts to renovate one of the patient and family lounges at Lyndhurst in the patient area. And we've also sponsored education awards for clinicians and allied health professionals. At, at Oli Vigman, we believe strongly in supporting the education of clinicians and health professionals through opportunities like this seminar. It's important that healthcare professionals are kept apprised of the latest information on healthcare discoveries and provided with a form for information sharing that translates into the highest quality of care for your patients, some of whom are our clients. I wanna thank you for the amazing work that you continue to do in these unprecedented and challenging times. And we hope that you enjoy the lunch that we've sponsored. Thank you very much. Okay, so I hope the audio worked that time. <laughs> so once again, I'd like to thank uh, Oli Vigman for sponsoring the, the lunch today. And uh, now on to today's speakers. I would like to introduce uh, Dalton Wolf, who uh, is a scientist at the Parkwood Institute and also an assistant professor in the School of Health Studies at Western University. And he currently leads the R2P, which uh, stands for Research to Practice Team at Parkwood that integrates clinical and research efforts to improve care and clinical outcomes. Dr. Wolf's focus is on implementation scientists and integrated knowledge translation and are uh, most often applied to his primary research interests of adapting physical activity and activity-based therapies such as robotic or FES-assisted therapies to support mobility. Second speaker is Colleen O'Connell and she is the Medical Director and Research Chief at New Brunswick Stan Cassidy Center for Rehabilitation, and is also the Clinical Research Director of the University of New Brunswick Institute of Biomedical Engineering. Her research interests and outputs are broadly reflected, uh, reflected in the tendency to being an early adopter in areas of treatment and applied technologies for mobility, impairment, and function. She also mentions that in another life, she would uh, much rather be an adventure travel guide. Our third and final speaker is Stephanie Morocco, and she's currently a PhD candidate in health and rehabilitation sciences at Western University and a research coordinator with the R2P team at Parkwood Institute. She's interested in better understanding the rehabilitation process that are associated with the best possible outcomes, especially focusing on physical activity programming and activity-based therapies in persons with neurological impairments. Being a true northerner, Stephanie loves playing and watching hockey as well as hiking and camping in the great outdoors. So the title of her their talk today is CANOE, which is the Canadian Neuromodulation Expert Collaboration in Spinal Cord Injury. They have mentioned that they are uh, happy to take questions at any point, so feel free to raise up your hand or even to unmute yourself if you have any questions at any point. We'll also have a period of discussion afterwards as well. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to um, pass the mic over to Dalton to start things off. And in fact, it'll be calling you that you pass things over to. So we'll just share our screen, which you should be seeing our presentation come up momentarily. And uh, Colleen, I guess, is going to take it away, providing you can see that. Okay, Brian? 
So thanks very much, Brian. And uh, thanks for the opportunity for our group to have a chance to share with you uh, some of the work that we've done uh, over this past year and a bit uh, with regards to this project that we, in a very Canadian way, have called CANOE, which is a, a, our Canadian Neuromodulation Expert Collaboration in Spinal Cord Injury. And uh, myself and Dalton and Chester Ho, who couldn't be here today, uh, but is very much part of this group as well, with Stephanie Morocco, who is, is our lead uh, person who is kind of kind of like that proverbial herding cats and getting us all together and, and moving this project forward. Uh, so as, as an outline of what we're gonna present to you today, and I think one of the important things uh, that we'd like to convey, and we're really hoping to get, get you know, feedback and insights uh, from all of you as a group, uh, I want everyone to be able to have an idea of our, our vision and what the objective of our canoe group is and kind of how we fit on the Canadian landscape as it relates to the neuromodulation. So we'll talk about who we are and how we work, what our key deliverables for this planning project were, and some of the pilots that we are hoping to now move forward with, and what we're doing right now and how we're going to take our next steps in terms of neuromodulation in, in Canada. So for a couple of learning objectives for our, our session today is that after this, you'll be able to describe what our overall vision and concept is of the canoe initiative. We're going to uh, present to you just one of the initial protocols that we're moving forward with a pilot and the, what's in current development for other testing of this protocol and uh, specifically in um, uh, neuromodulation and spinal cord injury at a few sites here in Canada. And then as a network or as a collaboration, what our next steps are. And that's where we're hoping to get some feedback from yourselves as well. Many of you in Toronto uh, have a great deal of expertise in neuromodulation and as well have probably been working on some national and even international projects. And so we hope to see hope that you will see where you might interface with us and sort of as a national initiative. So we'll go over kind of our, our overall objectives of what the canoe project was. And where this kind of all got started was um, there, I mean, it's really, this is an example of some very much patient driven uh, area of exploration and research you know, in, in the world right now, there are a number of places where it, it's possible for individuals who've had a spinal cord injury to be able to travel to and receive uh, an implantation of a spinal cord stimulator, uh, have some level of rehabilitation, perhaps, depending on where you might have had that, and then to return to Canada. And often then you are interacting and meeting with your clinical teams here and research teams in Canada. And we've felt, you know, we, we feel a little that we're perhaps underserving our patients. It's, it's hard not to, to tell somebody that we don't have an option for them right now. And there's this thing that's exciting and is offering some hope and potential. But we try to temper and balance that with the fact that, you know, we want to do things in terms of interventions with an individual, maintaining safety. Uh, that there's an evaluation appropriately, so as, as you would with any research that is ethical, that you're evaluating for outcomes in an appropriate way, and that we can move forward the science in a reliable way. And Praxis really took a big role in trying to bring together a Canadian group. And there was kind of birth through this sort of movement, uh, a Canadian neuromodulation interest group or neurostimulation interest group. And that was a really successful uh, uh, project, I guess, that has been ongoing and continues to move forward that has really brought the Canadian community together, both in learning more about what's happening internationally, nationally, and out of that evolved as well, um, Praxis having offered uh, some planning grants, kind of like a catalyst grant. And so Canoe is one of three catalyst grants that were awarded. And our overall objective uh, of the Canoe project is a little different than some of the other ones, but ours was to try and actually work towards building a Canadian network that supports investigation and implementation of various types of neuromodulation. And our focus was on 
trying to move the science and the clinical applications forward, but in a structured and scientific way, and also being done in a way that is collaborative. So in a kind of taking a very Canadian kind of non-competitive approach where we could share resources, share learnings, work together to support each other to move this field forward. So our vision is that we are a participatory collaborative approach, which includes persons with spinal cord injury or the lived experience, as well as researchers, clinicians, and policymakers from across Canada. And so our, our guiding principles of, of what we're doing, and, and uh, Stephanie and Dalton are going to go into the details of what we've actually done with, with this planning uh, grant and the CANOE team, is uh, our work is really towards the greater good. It's not for the promotion or the acceleration of any one of our particular careers. So our focus has been on sharing those deliverables to help support the entire spinal cord community. Um, we are trying to ensure that we involve persons with lived experience in a meaningful way. So they have been involved with both the initial application, involved with our meetings, and providing their input at all stages and wherever they wherever felt appropriate in both what we're doing, uh, what what avenues we pursue, and uh, you know we try to make sure that we're engaging in a meaningful way. Uh, their inputs on these types of approaches and how it impacts them, uh, ensuring that accessibility. So we're trying to really take that patient-driven approach. Our, our goal is that we have what we develop in terms of either protocols or outcome tools is that everything is going to be open source and that it's not going to be owned by any one particular center and that if, if, if we uh, come up with our toolkits, for instance, on outcome measures that we will share this willingly uh, with others in order to use it with, with their own clinical or research programs, as, and the same approach with things like uh, treatment protocols or intervention protocols. Our goal is really to facilitate not just ours, but others' uh, research and uh, protocols and opportunities. We aim to be inclusive. Anyone who wanted to join us was not turned away. Uh, we, we keep the doors open and it, the, the aim is really to be participatory. And as well, uh, our ultimate goal is that whatever protocols or projects or research that we're doing, the end result needs to be something that is accessible. So if we're, we're, we're trying to avoid doing a protocol or support or going down an avenue of research that is going to end up with, with an intervention that really is not feasible or accessible to the majority of Canadians. So if you're, you know, as an example, um, you would have this type of neuromodulation, but it would require five days a week of three hours a day, intensive therapy in an inpatient facility for six months. You know, that's just not going to fly at the vast majority of centers, for instance. So our goal is that, that we, we drive the research forward and ultimately make it so that it is easy to be translated and implemented within the community. And um, just before we move into some of our very specific deliverables and the projects that we're working on in Canoe, I just wanted to add in um, a, a little bit of additional context and just uh, highlight uh, Praxis. Um, this, this is a, a, a planning grant, sort of like a catalyst grant. Uh, that was offered by Praxis very specifically in the area of neuromodulation. And, and I think that that competition was informed by the initial work around the, the, the National Spinal Cord Stimulation Interest Group. And um, in terms of moving forward as, as an actual canoe, this is, you know, canoe is a, a catalyst in a planning uh, pro uh, program, and we are project, I should say, and we're in the end, we're hoping to have some clinical trials that are ready to go forward, and I, I think we've achieved that, as well as to have a, a, a toolbox of, of measures and protocols. Um, but in terms of continuing as a formal group, that may be, be contingent upon what types of funding or support we can get. But we are hopeful. We've, we've uh, got our foot in the door, hopefully with a couple of uh, larger grant proposals that will potentially be able to help support us. But 
just a, a shout out to Praxis that, that this has really been enabled by them. And a number of the, the collaborations now that have happened between different universities and people has, would not have been possible without, without this project. And so we're going to move now. I think Stephanie's going to take over and take you through some of the very specific things that we've honed down in uh, with, with our canoe group. Great, thank you. Um, so just building on um, more of the specifics on how we operationalize the uh, guiding principles that Colleen outlined, uh, which align really well with our objectives and kind of going forward. Um, so the we have three main objectives for this work, and one was to uh, develop the content of three areas of three working groups or modules uh, for stimulation parameters in whatever indication that was decided by our team. Um, outcome measures, so to build a toolkit around uh, what that indication might be, as well as some secondary measures and rehab interventions that would be complementary to this. And then once all that was put together, develop an implementation or knowledge translation strategy for this. The second objective is to have all of that content available in an open source way uh, so people can either implement it clinically or build it into their trials going forward. And then um, for our specific purpose, since it was a plan grant, was to use this work uh, to build a larger proposal and continue this investigation and team in the long term. Uh, so we have had a little bit of an extension for this project, so we'll be going until the end of August of this year. And so this is our team. I'll kind of spare the specifics of going through everything, but uh, as Colleen was highlighting, we're trying to be really inclusive of who is involved. So our team is a wide range of people across Canada for our steering and overall project team. And we have a small American represent representation in our advisory committee, um, but they're all clinicians, researchers, administration, and people with lived experience kind of all across Canada. Um, of which have their own work ongoing in this area that kind of bring their different perspectives, which has been really useful. Uh, so here's our visual of our governance structure. Um, along the bottom are the working groups or modules that um, we outlined previously, involving the stimulation parameters, outcome measures, the rehab interventions, and the implementation and uh, knowledge translation strategy. And that group, uh, intersects with the proposal development, which is our more recently formed group on the steering committee, which is uh, Dalton, Chester, and Colleen, and myself as the coordinator. Um, we intersect with the advisory committee, and our overall project grant was that long list of individuals that uh, all feed into kind of the other working groups as well. So towards the beginning of the project, we did have a priority setting exercise since it's really a large area to work in, um, more specific on what we should focus on. So we had a survey go out on what people thought our main focus should be. Um, and it came back as uh, a lower limb focus and a focus on spasticity as the indicator as well. Um, not to say that our outcome measures will be limited to those indications. We'll also have the, the um, a lot of secondary outcome measures available that it might go outside of those specific areas. Um, as Colleen was highlighting for our guiding principles, feasibility and access were really important. So our team decided to focus on transcutaneous stimulation, but not precluding um, the involvement of epidural stimulation as there was a lot of interest in our group as well. So supporting kind of both work where we can with a larger focus on transcutaneous stimulation. I will turn it over to Dalton to discuss the pilots and how that feeds into it. Great, thanks Stephanie and Colleen. And, and really just uh, to take up where uh, Steph left off there a little bit, um, really the, the, uh, the idea of a network that is bringing lots of uh, activity together means that although you're looking at a set of priorities, they, these really represent the people around the table or in the group at the time acknowledging that one of our deliverables is really to identify a multi-center clinical trial. And, and so that really did need to reflect the focus or the activities of the people around the table. That said, our larger goal of, the, of a network really ends up meaning that we're hopeful that, especially as things iterate and we may have recommendations for a network, that really we can do a better job across Canada 
um, in terms of sharing what's happening and so that everyone is aware, no matter where you are in Canada, of what is happening and that we might um, connect with each other when we see a trial that potentially a patient is coming to someone like Colleen and saying what's going on in Canada. And she might say, well, we're not doing anything here uh, in our immediate vicinity, but we know those people in Montreal are doing something that might best meet your needs. So that's sort of an end goal. Um, so although you, although we have focused in terms of the pilot activities on lower limb function spasticity, which reflected some of the work, especially going on in Alberta in our context, um, that certainly would preclude other work. And I know there's great work going on with Stuke as part of our group in Toronto as well on upper limb function, which you can see by that graph, there were several people interested as well. Um, so I will get into some of the pilot activities and other specific activities. First, I'll talk a little bit about um, the stimulation parameters working group, which was led by Dr. Dave Collins, who's at University of Alberta and really underway right now is a, a systematic literature review. Um, he's also uh, summarizing some pilot work that he and others across the network are doing. But the end goal is to have a better sense across um, studies that have been conducted for what specific stimulation parameters have been in play. And I know that um, the scoping review that was done um, by folks uh, aligned with Praxis that information will also be assessed and fed into this. Um, but the idea is just to get a bit better sense of what sort of outcomes might be associated and what indications might have been studied in the past and what stimulation parameters are associated with that. That work, all of this work is ongoing. We're in the sort of the uh, midway point or a little bit past the midway point of this project. Uh, as Steph mentioned, it's going till the end of August but that will be a deliverable that will hopefully come out uh, later in the summer. And, and another key activity that is going on right now is Dr. Ali Bateman from London, who's also a part of that stimulation working group, has really advocated for and has developed a process um, that really we see in the literature that there isn't a consistent standard for reporting of stimulation parameters. There are some folks that, that have developed um, Chester, for example, is one of them uh, in the realm of FES, looking at um, a bit more standardization around the reporting of stimulation parameters, but we really see a bit of a dog's breakfast out there in the current literature. And so um, we hope to have another publication that will come out around that reporting standard. Because um, we see the literature, it, it's in an early phase, obviously, in this area. Um, so that's to be expected, but one of the things that might help support it going forward is some guidance. So this will come out in the form of a recommendation for a reporting standard. And it will dovetail nicely with Dr. Collins' work um, because the literature review that he's being conducting will also feed in to the current state of affairs in terms of reporting uh, so that we can make the recommendations through a consensus exercise that will flow from both our internal group, but also the neuromodulation, the wider neuromodulation interest group from Praxis, pending their, pending their continued activity. Then, then um, after some consultation and, and um, we really settled on two pilots uh, um, that we are funding with small pockets of uh, funding within our group to help inform the, the specific trials that will come out as uh, the concrete deliverables um, by the end of the summer. And one of those is led by Dr. Monica Gorsini. Um, several of you will know her. Uh, she's at the University of Alberta. Uh, and this is uh, done in conjunction uh, one of the persons with lived experience um, has worked with her, uh, Ben Gill, who some of you may know, who runs the Ryu Recovery Center in Edmonton. Uh, and they have done some preliminary work looking at what we're excited about. Uh, and as um, um, Colleen and Steph mentioned, really we were looking for something that is very 
translatable and feasible. And so the concept of actually just using, as opposed to um, the transcranial, there are this way, the transcutaneous units that are maybe a little bit more costly, just using TENS units and understanding the impact that they have in terms of neuromodulation. Um, Monica and her team have had some pretty dramatic results with um, TENS and reduction of spasticity in persons with spinal cord injury. And so they um, were able to obtain a CAHR grant just recently funded um, that looks at more the electrophysiology and the, the sort of the basis of um, the potentially the mechanisms behind, behind that. And she's brought that work to our group in the hope that some of the sites that are involved in our group might do some piloting of that work from a more clinical perspective. So essentially she's provided the details of her protocol um, in terms of applying TENS units. And we have a, a, a method there that you can see on this screen that really looks at the application of a, of a um, single session um, and looking at the, how things change in terms of spasticity. Again, with a few cases, there's been quite dramatic results in reduction of spasticity. And then looking the, at the effect on the, the standard clinical test, i.e. pendulum or the modified ASWERT score. And then um, looking if, if centers have the capability to do some electric diagnostic testing, then they're also um, going to be putting in those things like the reflex testing, H reflex, M, M wave, et cetera. Um, and also looking at um, what Monica is doing there on number four is looking at single or spinal motor neurons um, using a decomposition decompos algorithm um, using high density service EMG. I'm actually not sure, uh, Colleen, if you have that capability at your site, but the um, for those sites that can participate, there's about three or four sites that are going to be trying different aspects of this. We're all going to be bringing our, our um, experiences together and then using this to inform a, an ultimate trial, um, potentially within a multi-center trial that goes forward to CHR and or an NH grant submission. So, and that's the model that we've been applied. We, you know, have some literature review going on. We have br people bringing their experiences. There's been recommendations for specific pilots. And then to the limit that is feasible, we've been asking other centers that are involved in the group to maybe try um, some of these things in a patient or two within their context. And then that will help inform the ultimate grant and protocol that get written up. Uh, hopefully this fall, for example, for the CAHR competition. Some, another pilot that was supported um, was worked by Dorothy Bartholomew, Bartho, Bartholomew in um, Montreal. And she, in a similar way, is looking at different uh, paradigms uh, or different uh, approaches to stimulation. You can see there um, that really she's interested in setting a post, uh, uh, probably a more traditional transcutaneous approach, um, and but then uh, comparing that with a transcutaneous, transcutaneous electrical approach, different frequencies or different uh, parameters, and really examining different, um, uh, you know, at different time frames, what are the effects of these different par parameters of stimulation. The idea is that in the end, within the trial that we propose, it is very likely that we will we'll be doing some forms of comparisons. Whatever comes out of the pilot might um, identify specific comparisons that we do. And whether we do do ultimately sort of a TENS, more feasible approach versus a transcutaneous um, approach that's one thing that's on the radar that we might be testing or what may come out of the pilot work is that we focus more just on the TENS unit and what are the impacts there. At the same time, different groups are also 
looking at the clinical measures that we might um, look or look at within these trials or different patient reported outcomes um, will also be overlaid on these. So it may be that um, especially the, um, the advisory group suggested, for example, that in their conversations, issues like fatigue were really important. So it may be that there will be a set of patient reported outcomes that we will have um, now tried on with during these pilots. And we may, um, you know, distill our efforts down into a few things that come from the patient experience. So hopefully that gives you a sense. I, I know that it's already uh, have maybe about 10, 15 minutes left. But that gives you a sense of how we've been operating. Um, there are some other working groups as well um, that are going on and the, the two key ones that are a little bit behind the pilot work, although they actually are also gonna be informed by the pilot work. Um, there is an outcome measurements, measurement toolkit that we are, are hoping to develop we have been waiting a little bit um, for an effort in the United States uh, led by Keith Tanzi um, and Matthew Roderick has been our primary contact um, who will share an outcome measurement toolkit. We have a working group put together um, that is recommending different outcomes that should be used with neuromodulation based studies. Uh, we're hoping to be greatly informed. We are prepared if that doesn't come in the next short time, that we will produce our own uh, recommendations for outcome measures to be used in a trial. Um, and, and then the other, and I've already alluded to some of the, it likely will be a constellation of sort of a primary indication, clinical related outcomes, some neurophysiological measures that will support those and also patient reported outcomes will be very important in this work that will be part of the toolkit. Um, then the rehab interventions group is probably gonna be last to come and is last to come on board, which now that we're starting to just still uh, down to our specific um, context for our protocol, then we will um, build the appropriate reha rehab intervention and or it might simply be more of a system for characterizing what rehabilitation is going on at the time that the stimulation is occurring so that we can understand the effects of the rehabilitation. But we will likely come up with both strategies that is characterizing the rehab interventions that are happening and recommending um, for the trial, the specific rehab interventions that might be most appropriate for the stimulation that is occurring. And then, so really that comes to um, where we are sort of now and what our next steps are. Um, so most importantly, really we're at the process of, uh, especially with the work of Monica and Dorothy, um, finalizing that protocol that we're gonna be um, feeding into um, the grants that will be developed from our group. Um, as was suggested, the likely focus of those things will be on spasticity as a primary indication. Um, there are a variety of lower limb outcomes though that will also be examined, things associated with balance, walking, posture, etc. And a really critical conversation in our group has been that we, however, will not preclude other secondary measures. Uh, and so I give the example of the importance of fatigue and other patient reported outcomes that have been identified by persons with lived experience. But it also may be that by stimulating in a certain way, there are effects on the autonomic nervous system. We know that's going to happen. So we will be measuring quite comprehensively autonomic function and or any other sensory function um, associated with these trials. Um, this work has already, uh, what probably the, um, the fundamental deliverable was to create, um, you know, to have spun out of your work um, or uh, future funding request 
And we've been lucky in that uh, through Colleen and her collaborators at the Institute of Biomedical Engineering at New Brunswick, uh, we were able to build a large neuromodulation component into a very significant grant um, or a, a letter of intent, sorry, that went forward to the CFRF, C Canada First Research Excellence Funds, which for those of you that know is a, a very large research fund and it's a, an entire program of work. Uh, and because of this uh, work involving Chester, uh, myself and Colleen, they fed that into that. And so University of Alberta, Western Ontario, but other institutions as well, BC, uh, Technology Infer Institute of Technology, and I think other institutes as well. Colleen can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, they were uh, brought into this, which really this um, um, canoe project ended up being a catalyst or part of things that fed into that very significant. And, and similarly, um, Monica um, is hoping to embed a more clinical approach, as many of you know. She is more of a neurophysiologist um, and interested in the mechanistic side of things. We, um, uh, through her though, will build a more clinical trials relevant um, um, proposal out of the work that we're going, that uh, is being conducted uh, with her idea. And there are others at the University of Alberta, uh, Vivian Masharwar um, and others that have fed into that as well, at Chester as well. Um, and then the other sort of targets for our work are the um, Craig Nielsen uh, skirts competition, which would be next year um, coming up. Uh, the letter of intent is due in the fall and Wings for Life also has a competition that would be appropriate for this work. So we're gonna leave it there in the hopes though that gives you an idea of the breadth. Uh, and we'd really love if there is any interest in a discussion or feedback or suggestions. Um, I, I, I didn't get a chance to see if Souk is in the audience and if she wants to comment on her own work because the, one of the other um, ideas is that um, really we wanna bring together, so the other uh, praxis, um, funder, people being funded, um, Andre Krasikoff in Vancouver and um, a group in Montreal where the other two groups funded. In the end, we'll want to bring all this work together and really come out of it with a Canadian sort of better idea of the Canadian landscape. Our group is really interested in, can we build a network that is aligned, coordinated, and, and has thinks about a model of how we might, um, especially as Colleen alluded to, um, when patients come forward, they don't have to leave our country because we all know what's going on, hopefully in Canada, and that we can get people to the right spot. Um, we can't, all of us can't do everything, but we can maybe have a system where there's a few specialized centers doing some of the more specialized work in this area, but that some of the work that is more accessible that a majority of the centers are able to uh, take part in. So I'd love to hear people's comments on that. And thanks for the opportunity, uh, Brian and others for giving this talk. Okay, thank you everyone. That was a great talk and uh, what a fascinating uh, initiative. And everyone has been very polite, but I'm sure they, there are comments and questions. Feel free to either raise your hand or put a question in the chat or even uh, unmute yourself if you have any suggestions, any questions, any comments. So this is more of an open, open uh, forum for any, any comments that people may have. So are there any questions from anyone in the audience? While people are thinking of their comments or questions, I, I'll start off with one. Um, you did mention a few times that uh, Praxis has a group that um, looks at neuromodulation. I want to see if you can expand on what the relationship is between the two groups and whether you mentioned also the um, 
the funding and how that could limit the um, future deliverables and whether that also impacts the other group as well. Certainly, I, I can start off on that if you would like. And, and I, I know there's a few folks from Praxis in the audience. So I urge uh, whoever, if so, somebody else wants to give the Praxis perspective, that would be really helpful as well. But um, from our, our perspective, I think we've seen a lot of energy um, and a definitely strategic direction from Praxis given these calls that have gone out, but also the neuromodulation working group that has been a catalyst for bringing people together across Canada. Um, I would say there's no like formal connection between that work and this, although it is certainly aligned. And um, the and it just speaks to the strategic direction that Praxis has formed in this area. That said, we would like going forward there for there to be a more formal, I, I think, and, and network may not be the right word, but it's just that we have some, some mechanism that we can align our efforts and make sure there's good communication sharing, good and linking of the, to the groups so that it isn't, you know, in this, Toronto is doing this. Uh, like there are activities in Calgary going on right now. Um, but really the people on the ground in the, in the centers that are talking with the patients, um, some do know, some don't know, you know, what's happening at each of these centers. And our vision would be that the, whatever entity, whether we call it a network or something else, it really is aware of all these things. And that ideally we get more coordinated in, in these things so that uh, again, we're serving the persons like on the ground, whether they be the clinicians or the persons with lived experience better, more fulsomely. And people don't go halfway around the world when they really just go had to go to the next province to get something that was maybe even safer in the end. Uh, I don't know if Kathy or sorry, if Colleen or um, someone from Praxis wants to comment as well on that. Yeah, I would just comment and, and I, I, I would ask if John or Vanessa could, could, could uh, give us the background, but it, it really was, um, it, like, I feel like this was something that was brought, you know, to, to the forefront by, by people with lived experience and, and their demand and their interest and their inquiry which then, you know, made us a little distressed as clinicians. It's, oh my gosh, you know, I don't have something, you know, this is available in other countries. And I, I, I feel like I'm turning up empty for my patients, you know, and I can go through the song and dance about, well, you know, we need to do things properly and we need to research things in a proper way. And it takes time, et cetera, et cetera. But meanwhile, you know, in the meantime, headline news everywhere. And uh, I think, you know, my, my feeling is that Praxis really listened to that and, and brought us all together as, as Canadians and, and helped get us up to speed on the state of how things were internationally. And then also in terms, listen to us in terms of, well, how do we get our foot in the door? How do we move an agenda forward in a Canadian fashion? And, and out of that evolved sort of both this interest group to kind of keep us networked and informed and as well then these catalyst grants to give opportunities for Canadian groups to apply for a bit of base funding to help them move the agenda forward so that, that, that. Right, so you had your hand up uh, respond yeah, thanks. And uh, it's Vanessa here from Praxis and just wanted to, to thank Colleen, Dalton and Stephanie for the, the great presentation and also just to uh, really say that it was, as Colleen and Dalton said, it was the clinicians and the people with lived experience that said this is something that needs attention as we, as Colleen said, watched individuals go to Thailand. And I think the approach with the Canadian Spinal Stem uh, Interest Group is really just bringing everyone together to get these technologies translated in into the hands or to people with spinal cord injury, it's a number of steps along the way. And so it's really, I think a collaborative approach is really what we need in Canada and then we'll all win. And, um, and it's also bringing industry to the table, which we haven't done before. So we're trying lots of different things and, and carving up some new paths, but um, 
always just want to keep seeing what it is that we need to take that next step forward for translation. And uh, I think there are a few things ahead that we need to, as a community, work towards is how we get these reimbursed, how we, you know, ensure the lifelong people can have these stimulators and then get them tuned up and then continue to be able to access the system. So I think we're we're on that journey. But as we work together, I'd love to hear how we keep moving forward and then what is needed and how Praxis as an organization can support it. Thank you, Molly. Uh, you, you, it looks like you're dying to, to say something. Go ahead, Molly. My, my question is actually to Dalton, uh, but I might want to ask one to Vanessa as well. Um, I think it's really, uh, really an interesting way to approach things. Okay. My sense is there are mechanisms that might be able to be used to Vanessa's thing, thinking about SPORE kind of grants and things like that, that bring people together. And that that becomes probably the one thing that is on the table in Canada uh, from that perspective. Um, they've done it in diabetes, they've done it in stroke, they've done it in other places and it seems to work. But my question to Dalton is, is, is um, I see that we're, your, your specifics of looking at a certain area, spasticity, okay, um, and lower extremity is sort of the focus, okay, in the context of thinking about neuromodulation. My sense is, is, is that with what's coming out of the literature recently about spasticity being such an indicator of the fact that there's some incompleteness there and something to work with in the context of movement and movement as it goes forward uh, as uh, longitudinally, okay, um, for recovery, um, <laughs> I think, or I'm asking you the question, how are you dealing with the actual problem that we have with clinical epidemiology is I guess what I would say of spinal cord injury and its longitudinal profile um, in the context of doing these pilot testings that are sort of small and single subject with et cetera, because, because I, I think it's one of our Achilles heel for any research study we've ever done. And our sample sizes are too small for big clinical trials. It doesn't matter if we bring the whole country together. I mean, if you did the analysis, we haven't got enough of anything, okay, even in the country to do something very specific that would really get at the nitty gritty. That's my one question. And then my other question is the, I think the whole electrophysiology area has to be integrated very quickly. Um, I mean, and, and the reason that I say this is, is sort of strange, but there was a, a lecture that was done, okay, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I guess it was out of Tri or Kite or whether it was, or whether it was the university, I don't know, I can't remember. Um, but, but the new strategy for electrophysiology is driving the modulation and the stimulation of all types of things, and specifically for individuals who have spasticity, and looking at that. And so, um, really getting at that I think is important and the other point I would just make is and, and this is the funny part about it is you know I did H reflexes in 1972 that's how old I am but the interesting thing is there's a whole Japanese group who's working on that looking at things back at presynaptic inhibition the sensory input the proprioceptive input in the context of spasticity etc that are publishing and they're quoting the articles and the only reason I know that is that that because I belong to ResearchGate, for example. Okay, so my point is, is, is that, that other groups internationally are really picking on those kinds of measures coupled with the clinical outcomes are going to be important. And so really having that hardwired in here, I think is going to pay off and it needs to probably be upscaled, but it's just my analysis and perception. I don't know if you have a comment on that. Definitely a comment. We certainly don't have a solution, I would say yet, but it's great to see you, Mo Molly, first and foremost. Um, and thanks for the, your question. The um, p integrating people like Monica, Dorothy, and as, uh, several others together with the clinicians is intentional and important um, to get at these. And so that's been from day one. We, we started off with discussions around, oh, mechanistic versus clinical. Um, but really, I think we've been successful in our group to, to really come away with, just as you said, interweaving those is going to be critical. And that's actually where the outcome measurement toolkit is gonna to come in so that it, it becomes 
a set of measures. That said, if that's not in your skill set, in your toolbox on a given center, it's going to be really challenging. So this is going to be a, of an evolution of building capacity for sites that can bring those things together. And I would add in the patient reported outcomes are also going to be, have to be interwoven um, because, and, and whether you characterize those as clinical as well, but I, I see them as th sort of three sets of different things. So absolutely really important. I'm not sure we are far enough along in our piloting to say that we're going to be able to be successful in the specific measures, but you're absolutely right. There's there's emerging literature that this seems to be more important. And it's not just the Japanese groups, for example, that are bringing in a lot of these things and trying to interconnect them. So there's not so not as much siloization in the way people do their outcomes. So that's going to be critical. It's going to be woven into our protocols going forward. So I, I probably can't say too much more than that. So, but does that mean we really do need, because we're a small country with a small population and a small population of, of individuals, even though we have, you know, our own, our own expertise, um, is there any advantage of, of really thinking about who internationally should be in this team? That, Not, that is one thing, definitely international. The other thing that I would say we do better than any other country is our networks, um, our existing networks, whether it is a consortium that Kathy and I lead or other networks, capitalizing on those networks that bring rehab centers together. Um, Red, the registry is the other big network. We really are in a state where we can capitalize on, on those. And some of the more recent grants, I've seen the feedback from reviewers and they basically say, oh, this is the only group that can do this. Uh, because they have the existing network that can be capitalized on. That said, I think it needs to go beyond our Canadian networks, because even though we're well-connected, we're collaborative, we're, we work together well, um, it, it might be bringing a couple of networks together, whether, whether it is MSKI and, and working with Armin or others like that. That's really a, an important strategy. So I, I see that we're at the top of the hour, and so I'm going to conclude things, but Dalton, uh, Colleen, Stephanie, can you stay around for a few more minutes? Because I still see some people who have their hands raised that may want to comment or ask a question. So is it okay if you stay a few more minutes? Happy to. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So I thank everyone for uh, participating. And uh, again, I also like to thank uh, Oatley Figman for sponsoring uh, today's lunch. And next month, we are going to have Wagner Souza present to uh, the Juice Lecture Series. That's going to be the last one for the academic year, and we will resume in September. So next, next month in May, we are going to have Wagner Souza. So once again, I would also like to thank Dalton, Colleen, and Stephanie for uh, such an amazing talk today and a provocative discussion afterwards. And I uh, Thank everyone and hope you have a great weekend.